You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. You're listening to Tea Break Time Travel, where every month we look at a different archaeological object and take you on a journey into their past. This is episode six of Tea Break Time Travel. I am your host, Matilda Siebrecht, and today I am savouring a rooibos tea flavoured with orange and lemon. Very citrusy. Joining me on my tea break today is Valerio Gentile, a PhD candidate at the University of Leiden. Are you also uh, on tea? I imagine as an Italian, you're probably more for coffee or are you a tea drinker? I am absolutely a coffee drinker, but today is tea because I run out of coffee. So. Oh, too much uh, drinking, too much stress, or it's uh, just you know it just I finished it on uh, on Friday and then weekend was in the middle and I still have to go buy it. So. <laughs> Although at least in the Netherlands things are open at the weekend. Here on Sunday everything is shut literally, so you can't if you forget to go to the supermarket you can't get anything until gotcha. Monday again, which, uh, yeah, was our issue today. But luckily we don't really drink coffee in this house. So, uh, that was fine. <laughs> anyway, <Shame. laughs> are you though, when, out of curiosity, when you drink coffee, what kind of coffee do you drink? Haha, <laughs> That's a great question <laughs> because, uh, despite being Italian, so, uh, basically being raised knowing that the only good coffee is the espresso. <laughs> In graduate school and in the PhD, I basically got uh, used to non-espresso coffee and also the idea of sipping and savoring coffee for a longer time. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've recently switched to French press uh, so I can, I can make uh, the coffee a little bit uh, less es espresso, a bit, a bit uh, uh, how would you call it, closer to an Americano, although it's better. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm, I'm a French press guy right now. <gasps> Oh no! And what does your family think about that? I haven't, I haven't disclosed that yet. Uh, I, I think <laughs> when I go back, uh, I think I'm gonna buy a French press and actually make everybody try because it's it's a, it's a different kind of. Uh, again, also with tea, you know, there is a ceremony around it and, and a context. It's a different kind of uh, a different kind of situation. Uh, my French press is literally for savoring uh, and reading papers and sipping a copious amount of coffee and it's not just a, a small a small cup of espresso it doesn't give you the same kind of uh, fair because uh, out of curiosity with yeah. espresso are you you're not supposed to sip it then you're supposed to like down it or if you sip it is anyways three sips okay. <laughs> so yeah. uh, most likely you just down it or at least just two two sips or something uh, the typical business business breakfast in italy is yeah basically you down it in one go and you eat a croissant and you're going to work yeah, uh, fair yeah. enough. I have to admit, I'm so I, I don't know why I just never drank coffee when I was growing up. I really love the flavor of coffee in like cakes and mm -hmm. chocolate and those kind of things. But the only time I remember like the first time I properly drank coffee, I was going somewhere really early and it was like 5 a.m. and I was with some friends and they were like, we need a coffee. So they went to like a Starbucks and I was looking at the menu going, maybe I should have a coffee because I feel so tired. So I just said, what's the thing that tastes least like coffee on this <laughs> menu? And I had like a white chocolate mocha or, you know, something like that. <laughs> and it was so delicious. <laughs> it's so good. So basically I drink coffee as long as it doesn't really taste of coffee. <laughs> so. It's an acquired taste like everything. I think uh, almost most, most of alcohol, or, or, or cigarettes. Not that I'm advertising any consumption of, of these things, <laughs> but and nobody nobody like it likes it at first try, right? True. Yeah. yeah, yeah, very true. I think I just have a sweet tooth as well, so I'm mm -hmm. not. Yeah, I, I'm not willing to try things if they don't initially appeal to me. Which, uh, yeah. Good. Anyway, um, <laughs> so good. But we're on tea. That's excellent. Um, what yeah. kind of tea is it? It's um, mint oh. and uh, something that I don't know how to say it in English. But thanks, thankfully, I know how to say in German, so you might help me. It's that mountain uh, flower, the Edelweiss. Oh, I think, yeah, I actually don't know what that is in English. All I know is that it's from Sound of Music because he sings Edelweiss, but uh, <laughs> I actually don't know what it's called. It, it, it's, it's an alpine flower. And, oh. uh, yeah, but I based, you can just taste the mint mostly. Yeah, but. fair enough. Oh, well, it sounds very nice and refreshing. So uh, you are here today, uh, not just for your excellent knowledge of coffee uh, and tea, <laughs> but um, because uh, you are indeed doing a PhD at the University of Leiden, as we mentioned, um, yeah. and focusing on archaeology uh, and the exact topic we'll get into a little later. But in terms of archaeology, how did you first get into that field? 
Huh. Uh, that, that's a, it's a, it's a difficult question in the sense that I don't know. Uh, it's kind of happened. Uh, you woke up one day tied to the, you know, chair of an archaeology faculty. Partially. I don't know how it is elsewhere, but literally like when you finish high school in Italy, you're like, like now what? And then you start like collecting informational material to understand what kind of uh, thing you would like to do. And I knew that I was not really the best at math. Not that, not that then math didn't hit me be- right back when I started really doing archaeology for real. <laughs> but anyways, I was hoping to do less math uh, and to some extent I succeeded. I, I also know that I had a fascination for the past and I also like the idea of, uh, maybe you can call it a non-choice at this point, but I like the idea of being a jack of all trades. And if there's something that really looks like a Swiss knife of disciplines, I guess, is archaeology. True. No. So I liked it because of that. And again, uh, how did I first get into archaeology? I think, I, I don't know if it was archaeology, but I always got a fascination for the past. Mm. And so maybe I don't know why I become an archaeologist, but I, I could have become easy, easily a paleontologist or a historian as well. But I always remember to be taken to museums and the museums that I liked the most were the ones about the past. And I wanted to visit archaeological sites, uh, maybe... Uh, you know, browse books about ancient Egypt or the Middle Ages and uh, things like that. So, or the Romans, because, you know. So I was curious because are you from, I can't, I know that we should have talked about this. Valerio, by the way, is a friend of mine. So I feel like I should know most of these things, but I realized that actually we talk about very random stuff and I don't know that much about your upbringing, etc. But are you from Rome? I was not born in Rome and I lived my, my school years in a smaller village in another region, but it's very close. It's like a hundred kilometers from Rome. Okay. Uh, but I always had relatives in Rome and mm-hmm. I then did my university in Rome. So I actually, I spent almost my, basically all my life until I moved to another country in between this country village and, and Rome, because also in pre-university times I was visiting very, very often. Okay. And so I'm curious because, I mean, I guess, to be fair, I guess in every country you're surrounded by some kind of history. But then if you think of somewhere like Rome, it's like it, the first thing that comes to your mind, even if you're not interested in history or the past is, you know, ancient Rome and all of that kind of thing. Is it when you're surrounded by that constantly growing up, is it something that then just becomes kind of blasé or is it something that you actually it does make you more interested in it? Uh, for me, it's difficult to answer this question because, again, of course, then I became an archaeologist, so it's hard for me not to notice things, uh, even if when I go for a run for a walk. But I guess some Romans, despite being a, being very proud, they seem to take some stuff for granted. But again, maybe a, maybe a, um, a side effect of this is that I have not become a Roman archaeologist. Uh, so mm. probably because I had um, too much exposure. Uh, <laughs> no more, no more Rome. Well, I can remember, I've actually never been to Rome. I would need to at some point, but I remember going to Greece at some point and yeah, just traveling around loads. And at the part, I was always really interested in the past when I was younger, but I can just remember, I think I was there for three weeks with a friend. I was very young. I was like 17. And uh, I can remember by the third week, you know, it was kind of like, oh yeah, cool. Another temple. Yeah. Another, <laughs> another column. And I, so I could do I can't even imagine how it must be like to live around it, you know, and just see it every day. Yeah. yeah. And I think uh, partially it was also during literally my archaeological training. Like at the beginning, in fact, uh, I, I'm actually rediscovering things as I'm talking to you because now <laughs> some, pa- some time has passed. But I think at the beginning, I was not too much uh, not into Rome. Uh-huh. Uh, it was always not exactly Rome, but maybe Italic tribes and periods, like literally when Rome existed, but it was not big. Mm-hmm. And then I moved slowly, basically went to early Iron Age and then Bronze Age. <laughs> Who knows, maybe maybe you will find me in 10 years just doing Paleolithic archaeology. Dude. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> Rock art. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But uh, I was at the beginning a bit fed up with Digging uh, every time I, were, I was basically digging something up, it was like through layers and layers of Roman trash. So mm-hmm. I was like, yeah. Yeah, no, I want something else. <laughs> but I think Roman archaeology is also one of the few areas in the world where it is predominantly studied by Italian or even Roman archaeologists as well, right? Because I guess one of the things with archaeology that I find at least is that it's so international. So it's quite normal to have, you know, like I am. Um, 
Scottish living in Germany, studying Arctic, <laughs> you know, things mm -hmm. and you're Italian living in the Netherlands, studying Dutch, uh, well, or European, shall we say, Bronze Age. Whereas in Roman archaeology, obviously there are still a lot of international influences, but would you say the majority, obviously you don't know because you're not in it, but I'm just curious if you do know, um, the majority of it is still Roman or Italian archaeologists? I would not say the majority. I would say there's yeah. a fair representation about Americans or Germans or mm, actually okay. anybody. Uh, it's big. Uh, and I mean, there are actually yeah. even different different attitudes towards the discipline that you can track down to certain nationalities. Uh, okay. or, but now I, I will spend my afternoon thinking where Italians are represented the most in archaeology. So it's probably either classics or, or Middle Ages, I would say. Middle Ages, really? I wouldn't have, I don't know why, but I wouldn't have thought that. I would always think, uh, yeah, indeed the classics, but... Uh... Yeah. It's one of those funny things as a non Italian, or I guess as someone, I guess whenever I think of Italian history or prehistory, I always think indeed of the Roman or the sort of ancient history. It's really hard for me to picture like Ita Italy in the middle ages. I can't even. No, exactly. Okay. So let me just make this like uh, uh, unpaid uh, advertisement for the minister of tourism in Italy. Uh, um, <laughs> Also Rome, I mean, okay, for sure, yeah, Roman stuff is cool, but also later stuff, mid uh, medieval stuff or early modern stuff are great to, to, to look at in Rome, but also it's worth it. a visit in Italy just to uh, look whatever happens after 1000 AD and nothing before and it's still worth it. So mm, yeah. think about it even if you don't like antiquity. <laughs> yeah sounds good for those listening there you go <laughs> if you're i mean i'd assume if you're listening to this podcast you have a remote interest in archaeology but if you know you you've accidentally clicked on your way to some sort of tea podcast then uh, there you go uh, go visit rome and check out the medieval um, history i also now want to actually i need to go at some point anyway sorry you're not a roman archaeologist have, as not. we've established <laughs> so sorry for grilling you about roman archaeology you're based in the netherlands are you also is your topic specific to Dutch or are you European in general? Uh, it's it's very European yeah. uh, and uh, I studied material for the reason why I studied is also because it's European, it's a widespread phenomenon so I'm curious but most of my sample comes from the Netherlands although I have also uh, other, I study objects also from other countries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, oh, nice and I mean you've had then quite a broad experience, I guess, in the different cultures around Europe, if you had your, your initial foray was more focused on Roman, and then have you had other areas that you've researched throughout your archaeological career? Uh, in my, as I said, in, in my undergrad, I was more of an early Iron Age uh, mm -hmm. or even late Iron Age kind of person. So my, my thesis for my bachelor stopped at around 600 BC, okay. uh, so way, way more recent stuff. It went basically from the 10th to the 6th century BC, uh, while basically I stop now around the 10th or the 8th century BC. Yeah. So, uh -huh. So you're just going further back and further back. Yeah, exactly. That's why I'm saying eventually I'm going to just do paleolithic <laughs> or even turn into a paleontologist. <laughs> And so seeing as you then are just going further back and further back, but if you could travel back in time yeah. to a particular point, <laughs> this is my standard question that I ask all the guests, where would you go and why? This is, uh, this is something, of course, that uh, I, I get asked many times, but also wonder myself, and it's just <laughs> actually, you know, going back and not to, not to, again, shoot myself in the foot because I said Middle Ages are really cool. I think the only thing I can agree on is I'm going to travel somewhere that is BCE, but it's very hard for me to pick one because again, would you not want to see Rome? Would you not to want to see Egypt? But mm. would you not want to see anything in Central or South America? Yeah. Or again, I do Bronze Age, so I'd be very curious if my theories and my interpretation are correct. <laughs> uh, but That's again, dangerous, no? would you not want to meet a Neanderthal tribe? Oh, so it's yes. uh, it's oh. very difficult. Yeah, uh, that would be cool. So I guess just to go back and see like everyday life then. Yes, no, for sure. I basically do ethnography yeah. back in uh, back in yeah. the time. <laughs> yeah, archaeoethnography. Well, I guess yeah. Oh, oh yeah, no. Oh, the more I talk about this, I always used to be of the school of thought of like, no, I wouldn't want to time travel because 
like it, it's the past, it's been, you know, we shouldn't go back. But then the more I talk to people on this podcast, the more I'm like, oh yeah, actually that would be really cool. Oh, but I, I would not want to intervene at all. <laughs> no, no, but it's more the, for me, it's the, the fact that archaeology is such a great thing because you don't really know what happened, you know, like yes. it's, it's a lot. And so then going back and actually seeing it would almost, yeah, I guess I said in the last episode, like take the magic away <laughs> in, in a way for me, um, which, but I don't know if it would, but I guess that was always what I thought. You do have a big point, uh, and, I, and I think you're right to some extent, but also, uh, I mean, and I'm not very optimistic most of the time, but uh, let me be optimistic. I think the wonders that we could see mm. and discover if we could actually travel back in time would exceed maybe the, you know, the, the fall from grace that we would have knowing <laughs> that something that we thought was symbolic and super ritual was actually completely functional and not poetic at all. But yeah. so much, so many stories we never heard of, so much music we never heard of, and uh, or, or or some gatherings we could not even fathom yeah. happened. So true. The sort of intangible parts would indeed yes. be really cool to see and experience. That would be nice. Before we look at today's object or talk about today's object type, I should say, we're first going to journey back in time. Indeed, we're going to go back to the Bronze Age. So around. 5,000 years ago to the city, 5,000 BCE, I apologize, to the city of Megiddo in northern Israel. I'm not sure if I'm saying that correct, but in my defense, they probably wouldn't have called it that either. The city is wide and sprawling. There's clustered of houses scattered between large open spaces. It's the start of the day. The streets are slowly filling, getting busy as the inhabitants go about their business. And towering over them is the shadow of the huge temple with the faint sounds of sung prayers drifting above the chatter of the crowds. But another sound also pierces the chatter, a loud hammering as a copper blade is struck. The shape of this blade was actually originally cast, so not hammered out like we would know it from modern blacksmiths, but a little extra work is required to sort of finish it and finalize it before it can join the others that are left out to cool, their edges glinting in the sunlight. Exactly whether this would have happened is unsure, but archaeologists from this region have indeed claimed that the earliest known sword was found at the site of Tel Megiddo, although it is also unclear whether it's a sword or it might have been a dagger. I'm sure Valeria will explain the differences between these far better than me and, uh, momentarily. But today, indeed, we are focusing on swords, particularly on bronze swords. And we'll get into the details of that soon with our guest expert here. But first, I would like to have a look at the most asked questions on the internet about this object, courtesy of Google Search. So the first one that came up was, are bronze swords strong? A, a question for me. Okay. <laughs> From the internet. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, okay, first of all, I let's say I am an enthusiast and a scholar of uh, swords and other weapons, <laughs> but I mean, don't take my word for for, for uh, like the Bible. <laughs> I feel like we should add that as a caveat to every single paper that anyone ever publishes. In our exactly. Community. I'm exactly. quite well read about this, but <laughs> don't take my word for it. Okay, so strong is a complicated adjective because... It's not very well defined. I mean, maybe is it like hardness, what this person wants to know and stuff like that. And also the point is these kind of measurements are relative. Like it, something can be harder or softer or stronger or weaker than something, something else. But it would be uh, good to know what's the comparisons. I guess the way I would interpret this question might be because you think of like a steel sword as, you yeah. know, something really strong and everything. Whereas bronze, I guess, is a softer metal than that. So are the For swords sure. also softer or are they worked in a particular way that makes them equally strong or, or how's the difference between so they for sure bronze is a less hard material than steel and also less uh elastic but are bronze swords strong enough may i add they are strong enough to be used i i don't know if maybe we're gonna end up talking about it later but i can add that uh in terms of properties the latest bronze swords do not really have much to envy to uh, the early iron swords. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, so, yes, in general, historically, we see an improvement in the properties. But yeah, bronze swords are pretty good or were pretty good for the time. Hmm, okay. The next one that we have isn't really a question, but uh, mm -hmm. was just bronze sword weight. Okay. So I guess... 
are they are they heavy? Are they light? <laughs> Again, uh, I guess but your so- listeners are gonna roll their eyes at the end of this podcast <laughs> because I'm gonna keep on answering anything else. This is a complicated question <laughs> because such politician we, Valerio. <laughs> because, for example, like what's a uh, sword weight? Like, uh, are we counting the the organic material that composed the hilt and the pommel, for example? Mm-hmm. But uh, roughly, just picture, and also it depends on much much by the length. Mm-hmm. Uh, and a little bit also by the composition, of course. Mm-hmm. But because again, we're gonna get there. But bronze is an alloy, so whatever you put in has different weight. But picture five hundred grams uh, as a sort of like standard thing, which is not necessarily an average. And then you can mm-hmm. uh, you you find sources are like four hundred uh, and sources are seven hundred. But it's that range, more or less. That's pretty, I would say that's pretty light. I mean, I'm just thinking I only did a little bit of historical sword fighting back in my day at uni and the ones we were using, I remember being, mm-hmm. I can't actually remember how heavy they were, but I can remember after an hour of flailing around with them, I was exhausted. So I can imagine. Yeah. I mean, you get exhausted also because of uh, the different kind of balance that some swords have, but this is, um, my knowledge is mostly, of course, about swords that are archaeological and not hilted and so on okay. but also bronze swords weigh uh, not not as medieval weapons because they are shorter on average mm, okay. so it's simply they're simply smaller and so they weigh less i can look up uh, more actually i mean i was not far off because i had it and uh, the replicas we used around for some experiments are the type that replicates the longest kind of source we actually ever found in the late Bronze Age and early Iron Age. And to, so they are long, and together with the hilt, they weigh between 800 and 850 grams. Okay. Uh, and these are the longest. And also the difference between the ones that weigh the most and the, un- the ones that, that uh, weigh the, uh, the least uh, is like less than centimeters, than 10 centimeters of length. Like it's six or seven centimeters of length of difference, so you can imagine that a slightly shorter source are like seven hundred or six hundred and so on. Okay, and you say six or seven centimeters. So how long, for example, like the longest-ish sword that was found? How long would that be? Ooh, I, I remember I answered this question. Let me get back at you, maybe, and we can add it later to give you exact me- measures. But the functional one or the most common ones hardly ever uh, over over like, exceeded one meter. They like, mostly are below one meter of length. But there are some rapiers which are extremely long and narrow, which are longer. Oh, very cool! I didn't realize that there were thinner, longer ones from from the Bronze Age as well. I always assumed there were these leaf-shaped sword kind of things, like the elven swords. <laughs> that is a very late Bronze Age uh, design, most okay. at least Bronze Age design, but there are also thin uh, examples. But I mean, also the, the fact that this kind of design didn't have much fortune also makes you guess whether it was really like a so effective design. Okay, yeah. Oh, very cool. The next question, hopefully, won't require a politician's answer, although maybe it will. <laughs> it's how were bronze swords made? Okay. Well, it could, I could make it into a politician, <laughs> in the sense that there are very different ways of making it. But in general, what you need is, first of all, bronze, which can come either in the form of bronze, the ready-made you know, ingots or other re- items you just want to recycle, or I- in its constituents, uh, because, okay, bronze is an alloy, so... Technically, bronze is a mixture of copper and uh, tin, but mm-hmm. of course, uh, there can be also other other materials added to the mix. For example, towards the late bronze age, we see an increasing amount of lead in this uh, alloy, which uh, possibly made casting more easy. Okay. And again, what you need to do is then what you high you you raise it, you, you heat it up to the extent that it becomes liquid. Uh, and then you pour it into a, a mold. Mm-hmm. You cast it. And uh, this mold can be either made of stone or sand or clay, but also actually bronze itself. And oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, because it's, I mean, although of course you need to heat up bronze high enough to, to melt, then when you pour it, it's not enough to melt your own, uh, your own mold. Hmm. Yeah, I guess I just. But know I never, I, I, to my knowledge, I don't know any uh, mold for swords made of bronze. There are other kind of uh, for other objects, but uh, for swords, I 
Uh, I think the only ones we have is like hints of clay, fragments of clay, and otherwise sword, uh, sword, sword, sword molds are usually made of stone. The okay. ones we find. But again, you put them in, put bronze in, and then once it cools off, you free the, 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 the cast sword, and then you need to basically polish it and remove of the sprues and the excess of material. You hammer it uh, to, to actually get better shape them, but also compress the grains to make, the, make it hard there. Mm-hmm. If you think you want to make it, for example, the edge thinner, uh, you want to anneal it also, because if you keep on hammering, uh, the, the bronze accumulates stress and then it breaks. So you want, after a certain cycles of hammering, you want to anneal the object, which means heat, them, heat the object up, not to the point of melting, but heat the objects over for roughly 600 degrees so that uh, the, 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 the internal stress is relieved and the grains are realigned, but the, the overall thickness is more or less retained. And then you go back to hammering again. Okay. Uh, un- until you reach the, the final the final shape and thickness you want, and also hardness you want, because basically if you if you hammer it you harden it, but if you kneel it the bronze goes back to its original hardness, so you lose what you've done except from the shaping uh, when you when you hammer. Like a computer game, and you just go back to the first level. So basically, okay, but to make it very very simple, <laughs> if you're making a ornament or something, it's very lucky that you're the last thing you're going to do is probably annealing because you shaped it and then you just make it, uh, you heat it up and you make it more flexible again and less uh, less uh, less hard because you don't need it. Mm-hmm. And maybe if you're doing something with an edge, maybe the last thing you do after the virus cycle is hammering it so that it retains the hardness of the grains being compact. Okay. Uh, so basically once you, once you, once you, sh- that once you have achieved this, you, sh- you sharpen it. Uh, and then hopefully while you were doing this, somebody else was taking care of uh, crafting a hilt for the sword, cool. which often you would fix by the use of rivets to the... Okay. To the from, to, made from metal as well? The rivets are often made of metal, yes. Okay. Yeah. And out of curiosity, so you mentioned that the working of it by hammering can make it more, I guess, brittle and make it break. Yeah. If... For example, say you cast your sword and it doesn't turn out right. There's a, a crack in it or there's something's gone wrong, right? Can you reuse that bronze or can you only use the, the bronze material a certain amount of times before it just gets too broken or brittle or, or something? Like how, how many times can you heat it up to the point of casting? To the point of casting, uh, virtually endless times. Although okay. there are there are some indications that the more you recycle, the more you're gonna lose some uh, trace elements, and to some extent, also the tin, uh, the tin content uh, gets a little bit l- less. Okay. But I don't think it's a problem that is gonna emerge like right there. Uh, uh-huh. So, but yeah, I mean, just to t- uh, tag into archaeology, there are some research made about to quantify the extent of uh, recycling to objects that basically track how much uh, elements are lost during mm-hmm. these phases of uh, recycling over and over again. But no, you can. that's a good thing of bronze, is that if something goes wrong, you can just start over, but also even if you get tired of your brooch, you can turn it into an axe whenever you yeah. want. <laughs> oh, that'd be nice. <laughs> but And in terms of like the archaeological evidence then, how would we see that? Again, like that, for example? Yeah. But also because we often find some stashes of uh, some hordes of uh, fragmented material, which again, it's another big topic because it can also very likely be um, offerings, ritual offerings and stuff like that. But some others are, for example, found within workshops, uh, metal metal working workshops. And in general, even if these are could be also ritual offers, this does not mean that they were not scrap in the first place. Uh, offered but still scrap but we see many times this collection of literally like scrap objects or or, or, or broken objects which are meant to be put back in the crucible and uh, and melt again oh no very cool uh, that was my extra questions that wasn't from google but thank you for <laughs> answering those google questions i think uh, i think you were able to ex- expertly answer them better than me anyway but uh in terms of your work and sort of what you are specialized in then in terms of your research so what exactly is it about bronze swords that you're looking at? 
All right. So I, I studied swords and, and also other weapons, like mostly all, most of the bronze weapons in the in the Bronze Age. But swords definitely play an important role because of also the ideological aura uh, around the sword. Uh, why why I like them, or at least why I'm interested in the, in them, is that because from a functional perspective, or a more likely a practical perspective, is interesting to explore literally what people were doing with weapons uh, in what context in periods in which you don't have writing. Uh, hmm. So you basically it's hard to picture warfare or, or how violence was framed within ideology and so on. Uh, and also going back to ideology and uh, uh, swords and weapons seems to permeate Bronze Age worldview as a whole. It's not necessarily a martial thing, but again, they appear many times in uh, uh, rock art. Uh, I'm not an expert in rock art, but I dare to say probably it's the most recognizable piece of material culture you will see in rock art and depictions, hmm. also in terms of frequency. And there are, for example, lots of uh, so-called ritual sacrifice or offerings of these weapons in rivers and bogs, uh, which is completely non-functional in rational behavior to our standard, uh, which begs the question why these objects acquire this significance and what did they stand for? That would be a really interesting, I think those, I mean, the term ritual, right? We could get a whole discussion about that, but like the, those sort of indeed bizarre deposits almost that make you, like you just said, it's sort of a, why were they being deposited here? That would indeed be something really interesting to go back and look at, but has there Absolutely. been, I mean, yeah, it's, it's because it's not, is it just swords? I mean, what other kinds of objects are being deposited with them in these sort of ones? I don't know if this is... Uh, it's a good question. Saying. So the phenomenon of uh, deposition in natural places, deposition of objects in natural places is uh, a characteristic of the Bronze Age, although we do see depositions also during the Neolithic uh, in some parts of Europe, but of course not of bronzes. Uh, but bronze objects were somehow irrationally deposited. Uh, I mean, I'm using irrationally within the context of our Western yes. <laughs> consumerist mindset, but they were deposited uh, across Europe in many natural places. Uh, like again, as I said, bogs and rivers, but also sometimes uh, um, rocky areas or top of mountains and so on. They were not necessarily only weapons. There are mixed hordes or some hordes who are composed only of uh, ornaments, for example. So the okay. puzzle is more complex, but there are also specifically martial um, depositions uh, because uh, there are some horse which are composed only of uh, weaponry, sometimes actually even destroyed and bent or burned altogether. But there are also single depositions in which people, we, we know that they deposited dead and not much else, like mm -hmm. just a sword or, or, or anything else. And there are also different contexts sometimes, like for example, in the Netherlands, it is more likely to find swords deposited in uh, large rivers than in bogs and small streams, uh, while for access it would be maybe perhaps a different, completely opposite kind of scenario in which you would find them more in uh, less big streams, but more into the small, smaller water bodies. Mm, okay. And I like you mentioned very briefly just then the whole thing of, oh, you know, but of course we see it as irrational, but that's just because of our kind of modern mindset. I mean, we've talked a bit in the other episodes as well about the fact that, you know, we are in our modern context as well. I mean, in terms of studying then a subject such as swords, there's so much like loaded bias and assumption, I guess, about what we consider a sword to be and how we consider swords to be used. Do you find any evidence sort of to work against that? Or how does that play into the archaeology of, of swords or of combat? Oh, it's really interesting to see what, what swords does to, what, what a sword does to people, but not necessarily from the practical perspective in the sense that... Um, <laughs> what kind of research are you doing? For that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I, 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 do conduct <laughs> I do conduct experiments, but uh, in the sense that um, even nowadays... It's, it's when a sword has become extremely symbolic and it was symbolic when it was used. For example, in the Middle Ages, uh, it appeared again in depictions and heraldry and so on. But also nowadays, when warfare is most definitely not carried out with swords, uh, 
swords have a, a big, big uh, impact on us and in our symbolism. Like, uh, forget about science fiction, which is big on also in uh, in uh, technological swords and so on. But also, if you find any heraldry about uh, law enforcement or just law or government or even like medicine or something like that, there is probably a sword used to fight against something evil, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's very interesting that even if most of us never hold a sword, we still see something that is uh, powerful in this symbol. Mm-hmm. And I see these, I'm not necessarily saying that there is the same attachment of, of, of significance and meaning, but Source seems to be a powerful symbol also in the Bronze Age because, uh, again, for the treatment in terms of depositions, but also their presence in uh, particularly lavish graves. Mm -hmm. Uh, And also the existence of completely non-functional, aggrandized versions of Source, which were clearly like something that was meant to be a symbol or ceremonial, Mm -hmm. that they exist and they did not make aggrandized, I don't know, brooches or or (laughs) anything like that. Well, that's I suppose know. you could say the only thing the <laughs> brooches are only does, I suppose, in some ways. Oh no, you do have, I guess, the big. I'm thinking of like the big Celtic brooch. That's later, yeah, no. obviously. That's not in the Bronze Age, but uh, no. But we have big, big brooches. Uh, yeah, we yeah. do have them, but it's not like that. They are a big version of something small. They're just that. that that's their design. But yeah. we don't have like a much bigger, unfunctional version that should suggest True, that it's a symbol of something. Yeah. And how can you, I mean, you mentioned functionality yeah. and sort of symbols. So is there, is there, she says, knowing the answer kind of, um, <laughs> is there a way that you could see if a sword was used in the past? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I would hope so <laughs> uh, at this stage. Um, yes. Uh, so yes, for those who don't know what we're talking about, maybe you could elaborate on, yes. uh, on what you're doing. So again, one of the questions, uh, I think uh, now that uh, we've discussed about it, the audience might be uh, mature for learning what they do in the sense that they can easily put the pieces together. The question is exactly why these weapons were deposited in these rivers instead of being recycled. Why specifically those weapons and not others, which were probably recycled? And the, one of the question is, is it because they were used just before or sometime before or multiple times? And the way I'm going to try to figure it out, or I'm trying to figure it out is by using experimental archaeology and microwave analysis that if you follow Matilda, you probably know a lot about it already. <laughs> But what I do is performing experiments uh, with, with replicas of Bronze Age weaponry, see uh, what kind of uh, traces are developed according to certain activities on the bronzes, uh, study those replicas and those traces under the microscope, building a reference collection uh, that then I use for uh, when I go to museum uh, and I study archaeological material, I compare the traces that I found on archaeological material to this reference collection to reconstruct more or less the biography of the weapon I'm looking at. Is it clear? Yeah, I think so. Well, I mean, uh, the problem is I'm biased in this, I guess, because it's very similar to what I do, but I do it on bone <laughs> tools rather than on bronze swords. <laughs> You're creating these little these little traces through the experiments. Do you then see sort of the same traces on the archaeological collection? Are you able to say anything about that at the moment, or is that still yeah, yeah, no, no, I can say that. <laughs> no, 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 I can say that, uh, and I also published some of it. Uh, yes, uh, I, I might not be able to say yet to what extent uh, some traces are more prevalent than others, which can be indicative of different contexts and so on. But uh, who knows? Uh, uh, m- maybe, maybe I will uh, soon. And we can even re-record this. <laughs> but I, I can tell you, yes, that many, many, many uh, weapons do bear traces of, uh, of combat, or at least traces which are compatible with combat activity. To, and on top of that, you need to add the fact that not necessarily uh, each combat activity leave, leaves a mark on the sword. If you stab somebody in a soft tissue, you will not... Mm. you will not uh, create any trace on the sword so i would not be able to identify it but yet uh, this this sword would have been in through through combat uh, likewise also wood is difficult i mean sometimes can leave marks but it's difficult to to find marks uh, produced by wood okay. impact with wood mm-hmm. uh, and also combat per se sometimes some collisions of bronze against bronze because of the angle because of the strength uh, do not leave very evident marks 
which if you consider also that most of the weapons are not in perfect preservation, I'm talking about the archaeological weapons, uh, mm-hmm. so they are corroded uh, and you lost part of the surface and part of the edge, the fact that you can find a considerable amount of t- use word traces or combat related or combat compatible use word traces uh, is telling. Hmm. So it's likely or it's possible, shall we say, that there were many more, but they have just corroded away. Or yeah, I mean, you, you could even dare to say, and again, I'm not going to publish this, but I'm saying like, the technically corrosion finds its way into cracks. Mm. It's easier corrosion to, to attack uh, more the partial portions of the bronze, which is already damaged. Oh. So you could even say that the most corroded items, the ones which do not bear traces, were in fact the yeah. ones who bear the most. I think, uh, I mean, hey, you've published it here now. We all, we're all <laughs> going to go around and saying, no, but I heard this archaeologist on the podcast saying that. <laughs> I <laughs> yeah. would say that there, there, it's a possibility that some of them which do not bear traces of use might actually have been because used, but uh, maybe not all. Yeah, yeah. No, but that's really cool that indeed, because like you say, metal preserves kind of notoriously badly in most contexts it does indeed corrode very easily would you say that bronze corrodes like in relation to something like steel or iron does it corrode a, a lot more or is it generally better in terms of preservation uh a general i will not say if uh, corrosion is i mean i'm not a uh, conservator so I, I don't know if i'm using the term correctly but i don't know if it corrodes less definitely they oxidize less hmm. like bronze, bronze uh, copper alloys oxidize less and they preserve their structure more. Uh, the, re- the reason also why there is a lot of use where, not a lot actually, but so, some use where studies are coming out recently about bronze implements, but not too many about iron uh, implements is also because of that. Uh, mm. uh, but technically, you could. I also had the uh, opportunity to study some uh, later sorts, and uh, if they're well preserved, you could see the marks. Yeah. Uh, in general, yes, to just give uh, the audience like a straight answer, yeah, bronze tends to preserve better. Okay, yeah. yeah. I think we've learned through this entire episode, never ask Valerio something if you I'm want sorry. a straight answer. <laughs> no, it's good. I think, no, but I think that this is important. Like you mentioned a couple of times already in this episode, one of the things about studying objects in the past and focusing indeed on the archaeological objects is, I mean, like you say, the whole, the fact that you're looking at these traces, but up to 90% or whatever of the traces might have been corroded away. I mean, that's just an abstract number that I pulled out of my head, but it's sort of even the evidence that we have, we can't ever be sure that that is all the evidence. I mean, you know, well, it's definitely not all the evidence, but like we can't be sure that we're not losing the majority of the picture just because it hasn't preserved well. Um, So I think it's, yeah, I don't know. I think that it's always important as an archaeologist to add those caveats in and hopefully audiences listening to this or, or reading papers or anything will then understand that just because one archaeological evidence sort of says one thing, that doesn't mean that that's it. And that's the entire picture. Yeah. Don't trust me. <laughs> you know what I mean. Yeah. No, 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 sure. <laughs> and uh, so you already mentioned that kind of Bronze Age swords, the sort of fascination with them came from the fact that there's no kind of historic record to go alongside them. But you also mentioned that the, the styles of the swords change quite a lot within the Bronze Age already. I mean, how how much variation do you see and do you think it's related to to the changes in use? Do you think it's just change in style or fashion over time? Yeah, there is, um, it's it, it's a multifaceted answer, but <laughs> of course, what <laughs> I'm going to do. In the sense that, yes, there is both similarity and difference, and that's what's fascinating in the sense that, of course, there is like a, an evolution or at least a change over time. Uh, and also some regional changes, but there are also some types of weapons which are completely widespread. You can find them from uh, Greece to some items even in Egypt, but also at the same time you can find them in Scandinavia. Okay. So there are some objects which you think, okay, this is a design that really works and a lot of people that used and found uh, found uh, reliable and comfortable to, to, to use. And or compatible to use according to their own needs and tactics, mm-hmm. uh, but there are also some uh, differences. Overall, overall, as you said before, you can say that this leaf shape is the one that made maybe in different kind of variation from England to Poland, for example. But mm-hmm. more or less, uh, they, they they were similar. But there are also like source which will, will define as carp stone shaped, 
which is basically a little bit tougher towards the end. And again, at the, especially at the beginning, we see much exploration down towards the kind of rockier kind of design of like long or less long, but very narrow kind of uh, blade. Mm-hmm. So there is a, a change. Would there, just out of curiosity, you mentioned the long thin blade. I mean, because you were talking before about the fact that it's a sort of hardening and annealing and hammering process is quite sort of almost delicate to make sure that you have that balance of it being just hard enough, but not overworked. With something like a rapier with a really thin blade, does that mean that that would require a lot more, open quote, skill, <laughs> close quote, in to mm. make? <sighs> Possibly, like you could say maybe that also the spread of a certain sh- dimension in thickness, but in thickness, but also in length was also the result of Smith's thinking, okay, yeah, this is just much easier to do. But in general, it's also a problem of the material per se. Like uh, the more you make a, a bronze object long, the more you need it thick to not bend on its own. Mm-hmm. Because again, it's, it's not uh, the hardest. But you can do have, uh, do the same uh, consideration for any kind of material. Like uh, you, you can cut a piece of cardboard, and you can see how long it, uh, it, it how long you can get it until it goes uh, curves down, basically. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's one of the reasons why they are so short, or mm-hmm. not so short. Actually, it's one meter, uh, a little less than one meter, the longest. Okay. But yeah, that's for sure, skills skill is required also to do this kind of consideration and. Uh, it's also it's also about a lot about different ways of use. So for sure, you cannot use one of those leaf shaped swords you were just mentioning before and those kind of rapiers in the same way. So it's also mm. I guess uh, you then you, you you end up with the chicken and egg question is <laughs> whether they changed the sword big and the first because it was easier to make or at least more functional and then they changed their combat style or they actually adjusted the the, uh, the sword to their new developed combat style or context hmm. of use. Which is interesting because I uh, I know that so from from sort of medieval, which I believe is also from my memory, what your the experiments were kind of based on were the the historic texts that we have, yeah. which do actually say the kind of different positions and stuff. Do you think that that would have also been happening in the Bronze Age? Like there would have been almost the kind of set combat style or learned thing. I suppose a lot of people, when they think about uh, prehistory, even something like the Bronze Age, which is a bit more recent, I suppose, all automatically assume that there wasn't really kind of uh, armies or there wasn't sort mm-hmm. of uh, combat schools or anything like this. But what can you what can you say about that? Were there things like that or was it indeed a little more disorganized? Uh, it's also another question that could require a whole podcast uh, <laughs> because it's warfare in, uh, in the Bronze Age and tons of books have been written about it. Uh, okay. So... First of all, they were Bronze Age army for sure, mm-hmm. and we know it precisely because of uh, we find there were people during the Bronze Age uh, that were riding, and they were in the Middle East, in the or the Near East, according to what they call it. Anyways, uh, Mesopotamia, Egypt, mm-hmm. these people could ride, and they were or even uh, depict scenes of battles with armies uh, of soldiers armed with bronze weapons. So at least in some part of the world, they were in most definitely armies. Now, the question is, were there armies in Central or Northwestern Europe? Uh, this is a very fascinating and but also quite complicated question because it also uh, begs the question, were there political systems capable of raising armies in these areas, similar to the states that were actually in the Levant and that, that, that we know were capable of raising armies. We seem to have found in recent years evidence of large-scale conflicts uh, of with hundreds and hundreds of individuals uh, involved. So there is a suggestion that maybe if not armies, at least like a um, an alliance of many tribes could perhaps uh, come together at a certain point for a large-scale uh, conflict. Mm-hmm. Uh, this being said about combat schools, I don't know if there are combat schools in the sense of like literal uh, teaching, but we know, uh, yes, most of the archaeologists listening, but also crafters the you have encountered and also probably listening, that there are ways of doing things uh, which uh, change. Uh, so as much as probably a pot very much looks the same, there's no way to tell if, if uh, the, the pot has been made according to the same technique. So maybe mm. even if the, the same kind of weapon is found, 
in, in much much different countries, much different uh, regions, uh, very far away, you cannot definitely, most definitely say, yeah, they were used the same way. They were probably used uh, mm-hmm. differently. And uh, also we need to keep in mind context. Like maybe, again, some, some weapons were used for open warfare, some others as a primary weapon, some others not, some for dueling. So it's a, it's a, a lot of questions we are still have to answer. We still still have to answer. Yeah. I do. I always say I gave a workshop recently on microwave analysis, and one of the things I mentioned was like, yes, when you do any kind of research with sort of especially prehistoric objects, I would say you end up getting more questions. Like the more research you do, there's. Yeah. So many uh, more things. To ju- just to just to also give less of a bleak scenario that we don't know <laughs> anything. Uh, so let's say uh, my research continues. I mean, I hope it could, it will continue. It will conclu- be concluded. But then I need more people joining the effort. Let's say altogether we basically need to map a lot of the bronze mm-hmm. weapons in Europe, for example. And we map. We also manage to find an agreement on how to define traces and quantify them. <laughs> then, then, then you could, yeah again but, but then you could see patterns so even if we for example within the same uh, type of sword in different places of Europe do you see distribution of certain traces in terms of frequency but also in terms of what type of trace mm-hmm. and then you could maybe see indeed different ways of using the same item yeah oh that would be very cool that would almost be like time travel one yeah, could say, yeah. <laughs> in a way. I also really like the idea that you that you sort of alluded to before as well, that, you know, you say Bronze Age, but like you say, that can mean so many different things depending on where you are. I mean, 5,000 BC or 3,000 BC was very different in like the Netherlands to in yeah. Mesopotamia. I mean, it just looked, it was a completely different, yeah, society. So I think, yeah, like you say, context. But indeed, we know, I mean, not in 3,000 BC, but maybe in 1,000 there was communication. Uh, mm-hmm. you, you could see objects. Again, there is one uh, specific type of sword, which you can find from Scandinavia to Egypt uh, uh-huh. in, with different kind of uh, density, of course. Mm-hmm. Yes, which also begs the question, was there because of trade or was there because of mercenaries? Like this is spread. Like was the same kind of people traveling across Europe or was the sword yeah. traveling across Europe? <laughs> Then you get into material agency and yeah. <laughs> it's all this whole fun material culture theory, which I guess, like you say, is probably for another podcast episode. But uh, but yeah, and you uh, you talked about, you know, oh, your, your future of research and what people should do uh, to join yeah. the movement. But if anyone else wants to start a similar kind of research project or look into swords, I mean, it's such a cool topic. Uh, I can imagine that you get so many people interested probably in, in uh, pursuing this line of research. What uh, advice would you have? What tips would you have? Do you have any suggestions apart from, you know, don't do it, but. Uh... <laughs> well, you can do it. It's, uh, the first thing is uh, you're lucky uh, in the sense that when I started, uh, one of the reasons why I had to do these experiments is that I did not have any reference collection. And so I didn't know what a sword mark against another a sword colliding against another sword will look like mm. uh, in terms of and now whoever wants to start now will have not only my contribution to this but actually several other people not several but a few other people are trying to do this so we, they have a, a more more information to work on so we, mm. we, which is good but again we need basically field agents like I can be everywhere so uh, <laughs> if you're somewhere in a in a country that nobody has ever looked at those swords that just you, you should go and check them and report them report what you find so my advice is read like w- something that you finally have available which is these experimental papers and then as you probably can relate, uh, just practice a lot. I mean, you need to train your eyes to spot things uh, on the on the microscope. And uh, if you want to do exactly my type of research, but otherwise there are different kind of things you can do with metal weaponry, which is, for example, understanding uh, their composition and their and their uh, material properties, and maybe compare them again to different kind of uh, types or, or the same type across uh, places and so on. And actually, since you mentioned a lot of people coming to me to talk, there's also not only, I mean, I study warfare and what it means, and I study also who could potentially uh, have, have handled these weapons, of course. 
Uh, and a lot of questions come from people who ask about the identity of the warrior and what what does it mean to be uh, mm. a warrior. Mm-hmm. And interestingly, there are a growing number of uh, uh, women interested in this and also wondering, wondering <laughs> if, uh, for example, uh, where their female warriors and so on. So again, uh, this could also be another another. Uh, another aspect of uh, warfare in the Bronze Age, people might be interested in studying and researching. Yeah, no, it sounds amazing. I mean, that sounds like there's so much potential indeed for even just what we've talked about today. There's, yeah. you know, we had one hour and we already made, I think, about 50 different comments of, but that's, you know, that's a topic for another podcast. So, uh, yeah, definitely a lot of potential. So you have me as a fielder. Whenever you don't really don't know who to invite and what to talk to, then you yeah. always have like... <laughs> yeah, always have a backup. Well, we could do Valerio's episode part 24. <laughs> 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 Sounds good. But uh um, we have now been talking for quite a while, so that probably sure. would mark the end of our tea break and perhaps we should, uh, it sounds like you've got a lot to do, a lot to research in, <laughs> in the, the future of Swords. So thank you very, very much for joining me today, Valerio. Thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, if anyone wants to find out more about Valerio's work or the history of Swords or anything like that, check out the show notes. I'll put some lovely links uh, on the podcast homepage. I hope that you enjoyed our journey today, everyone. See you next month for another episode of Tea Break Time Travel. <laughs> I hope that you enjoyed our journey today. If you did, make sure to like, follow, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And I'll see you next month for another episode of Tea Break Time Travel. This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV traveling the United States, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, DigTech LLC, Cultural Media, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Chris Webster. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com.